Good evening, welcome, and we're going to begin this evening our worship time with uh, You Never Let Go, and you should know that. It'll be on projection, and would you join us as we stand and sing in worship? <clears throat>
really helps when you can keep the right page. Uh, Y'all didn't notice that, but I missed a page. And so anyway, we're going to welcome each other in fellowship for a few minutes. <clears throat> Well, as we get started this evening, we will uh, take your uh, prayer concerns. I'll share with you just a couple of ones that...
Bibles to 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 12. We'll be in verse 12 a little bit later in the study tonight. If you didn't get a copy of the handout for tonight, they're on the back banister, uh, and uh, you're more than welcome to grab one at this time. Uh, I'm going to share with you, uh, and as, uh, as I'm sure most of you know, that's the big dog sledding event up in Alaska that commemorates uh, a, uh, an overland race, not race, but a, well, it was a race to, to get medical supplies uh, from one point to another many years ago. But uh, it says the Iditarod race is the biggest race in dog sledding. Dog mushers come from all over the world to Alaska to meet and compete in a 1,100 mile race of endurance. Depending on the weather conditions, it takes the winner anywhere from 8 to 20 days. Now think about that. You start a race planning on 8 days uh, and it turns into a 20 day race, you might find yourself in some trouble, especially up there. But nevertheless, uh, it takes that long to complete this grueling task. Uh, 20 years ago, on March 23rd of 2003, Robert Sorley won the race uh, by crossing the finish line at 2 o'clock in the morning. It was 2 a.m. when he crossed the finish line. And although it was early in the morning, he was greeted by over 2,000 onlookers who came to support the race. Instead of immediately finding uh, a nice warm shelter and a meal, he stayed with the crowd at the finish line until the next musher completed the course two hours later. And so he stayed out there with them that long. He congratulated the accomplishment of the second finisher, uh, and uh, uh, they waited together for the next musher. And again, it took several hours for the third-place finisher to arrive, but he was greeted by those who had finished before him. And so it continued. They sort of, he started this domino effect of people finishing the race and then waiting to congratulate those that finished uh, this very grueling race. And once, the race, uh, once finished with the race, the mushers are not obligated to stick around. They can go find uh, a meal, find you know, uh, a warm place. But on this particular uh, race, every musher waited at the finish line to cheer and congratulate the next one to finish. Well, all but the last one. You know, if you come in last, there's nobody coming in behind you. So uh, they didn't get to, but nevertheless. Uh, but what this shows us is that there is an uncommon bond uh, between those that, you know, uh, are dog mushers that are doing these dog sledding races because of the uh, physical and mental toll that it takes not only on you but on your sled dogs. But there is this bond that they share uh, because of this. And so why do you think that they waited for each other? Why do you think the first guy waited on the second and everybody else waited for hours in the cold? Why do you think they did that? They were all in it together. Uh, that's a good way of looking at it. They all knew what it took to get through the race and how challenging it would be, whether you come in first or last or somewhere in between. They had this shared bond. They were all in it together. And so, you know, the, the thing for us is that the Apostle Paul tells us uh, in the New Testament, in his writings, that as believers of Christ, we also have an even more uncommon bond with the church, with the other members in the body of the church. Uh, in the body of Christ. And so tonight we're going to look at what it means for each of us to be bonded together in the body of Christ and what it means for us uh, to have that bond uh, like we're talking about. And so I want to ask you two rhetorical questions uh, this evening. Uh, one is when you think of the church, and when I say the church, I mean the church here at Oak Ridge, uh, but when you think of the church, where do you fit in? Where do you fit into the, the overall church? Uh, and the second rhetorical question that goes with that is, do you picture yourself as a part of the church? Or do you picture yourself as someone that just sort of is on the outskirts of the church and you just sort of float in and float out? Or, or you, have a, you have a part in the church, you know what your part in the church is, that you're a part of a Sunday school class, you're part of a particular ministry or a particular whatever in the church, and you know what your part is. And so think about that as we talk tonight uh, about what it means for us to be uh, uh, a part of the church. And the first thing we see 
And I'm not going to ask you to turn there, but it's in 1 Peter chapter 2, and it's in verse 9. We see that we first have to find our identity. You need to find your identity uh, as a uh, part of the church. And so uh, I'm going to read to you 1 Peter 2, 9. Uh, And this is what it says. It says, But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. And so here in uh, 1 Peter uh, chapter 2, it talks about three different groups. It talks about three different groups of people, so to speak, if you want to say that. And um, I'm, I'm trying to do this from memory because I didn't write in my notes which parts are in your handout, but I'm pretty sure you have the, the, li- the definition of people, priesthood, and nation. And so what that um, shows us is that first off, when he says that uh, you are a chosen people, You know, a people literally means a race. It means a a group of people defined by a common life. And so, you know, the the commonality between those in the church is what, generally? (laughs) Let, Let me rephrase that. Let me rephrase that question before you answer it. The commonality with people in the body of Christ is what? Everybody has a shared experience of faith, salvation, right, that, that we have a, a shared salvation experience and, and we have that, that shared faith. And so um, that is, we are a, a chosen people in that regard. Uh, the next one, he, it says there is a royal priesthood. And so a priesthood are those who have a relationship directly with God. You know, in the Old Testament, we read about that. We read about how in, the old, in, um, in ancient Judaism, the, the priests were the ones who spoke, basically spoke to God for the people. And the high priest was the one who was supposed to be, have like the, the main connection for all of the priests. And so, um, you know, they were the ones with the relationship directly with God for the Jewish people. Well, when Christ died on the cross and the Holy Spirit is uh, given to those who uh, receive uh, salvation then all of a sudden, there's no longer a need for that mediator, so to speak. There's no reason or no need for that high priest in the Christian faith because Christ is our high priest, so to speak. And uh, what we see is that when we have uh, the Holy Spirit living inside of us, all of a sudden, we are those who have a relationship directly with God. Because we don't have to, regardless of what the, the Catholic Church will tell you about priest and absolution of sin and uh, forgiveness of sin and, and they're, you know, the priest being the one that you know, basically is the connection to God, that's, not, that, that's more Old Testament than it is New Testament because the Scriptures don't teach that because we believe from what Scripture teaches us that as individual believers with the Holy Spirit living inside of us, we can, we can go to the throne of grace on our own. We don't have to have somebody be that intermediary for us. And so we are those people who have a relationship directly with God. And then that last one is a nation. That is a group of people in a community who work together to protect and advance each other. You know, that's, you know when you think about the, the body of Christ, that's exactly what, uh, what we see in the body of Christ. It's a group of people in community. And that's what we're t- we've been talking about this new community that was founded 2,000 years ago. We've been talking about the community of the church who work together, and uh, in the church it requires the work of everybody in the church, right? Because we're all skilled and in different ways. We're all gifted in different ways. But we work together to protect and advance each other. And that is, that is the responsibility of the church, right? We're to protect those uh, in our number. We're to, you know, protect them as best we can from sin by, you know, encouraging them to walk a life of faith and things like that, but also to advance each other, meaning that we're to help each other grow. And uh, when we use those gifts and abilities that God has given us uniquely to us, we use those to build up, as Paul says, build up the body of Christ or advance each other. So it's all in how you look at it. And so uh, these... uh, rhetorical questions that I have right now for you are, are based on that. And so just think about these. Do you feel like you are chosen? 
Do you feel like you are a royal priesthood or a part of a holy nation and, and as a person belonging to God? You know, if we are, if we are saved, if we have a, a, a personal relationship with Christ, then we are. We've been chosen. We're that royal priesthood. We're part of a holy nation that, and a, a people belonging to God. And so it's important that we understand that because sometimes we don't understand or we might forget our identity in the new community, the, the church, as we've been talking about, because it's easy to forget that God has given you an important place in his church, in the body of Christ. And so there, you know, the, the best way to understand it is there are no unimportant parts in the uh, in the body of Christ. And Paul does a great job when he's talking about, well, you know, if, if everybody's an ear, then, you know, where's the eye? And if everybody's an eye, where's the ear? You know, he's making a, a good example. There's no unimportant part of the body of Christ. So let me ask you this. Which of your body parts are you willing to give up because it's unimportant? I like all 10 of my fingers. I like all 10 of my toes. I don't want to lose anything. And so that's the way that we ought to look at it, is that if it's important to us in our body, then it's important for us to have a part in the body of Christ. And so, you know, we have to remember we're not an accident. We're not a mistake. We're created by God uh, with a purpose. And not only are we created with a purpose, but He has a plan just for you. You know, regardless of whether, uh, you know, it's the person sitting beside us, is our spouse or a family member or, or whatever the case may be, our plan and purpose that God has for us is unique to us. And so we have to remember that, that he has a plan for us and he wants us to accomplish that. So the second uh, thing we see about uh, what it means to be a part of the body of Christ is that we need to be an active part. And this is from Hebrews 10. It's primarily from verse 25, but 24 and 25 are basically one big sentence together, if you want to look at it that way. So you can't just start in the middle of the sentence, and it makes sense. So, uh, but this is one that I'm sure you're very familiar with. It says, And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. And the day he's talking about is the day of the Lord. Um, so uh, that's a, a Bible verse that uh, we hear talked about uh, from time to time, especially when we talk about those that instead of being an active part of the, of the church or the body of Christ, we're talking about those that are inactive. And, you know, uh, it's, kind of, it's kind of like uh, a preacher getting up on a Sunday morning and preaching out of this scripture to the ones that are there. The ones that are there participating in church. You know, you're literally preaching at the choir at that point. Uh, but it is, it's important for us to know because uh, it's, it's more than just attending church. It's, it's being that active part in the church. And so it's important that we understand that. So why do you think the writer of Hebrews wanted these people to get together with other believers? Why do you think that the writer of Hebrews wanted these people, people in the church, to get together with other believers? That's how you grow. That's a, that's a good point. What else? Encouragement. Encouragement. What else? Has anybody ever had support from the church besides encouragement? We gain support from the church, from our brothers and sisters in Christ, especially those that maybe have gone through something that we're dealing with or something that we're facing in our life. And so they're able to give us support and, as Herb put it, encouragement. Uh, so there are a lot, it's more than, you know, I, I remember years ago uh, when my great grandmother died. She died when I was like eight or nine years old. And she was 85 then. So that's been, you know, many moons ago. Uh, but I remember when we were, we, my mom and dad, because she lived next door to us, they bought her house in the, the, the little lot that her house was on. And we had to tear down Grandma Annis's house. It was Grandma Annis, actually. Uh, and uh, so when we were tearing down her house, we were cleaning out stuff out of the closets that the family hadn't wanted or didn't need or anything like that. I remember coming across things for her and my, and my great-grandfather, who I never met, that were basically attendants uh, church attendance 
awards with gold stickers and things like that on them from where they had attended church uh, for, for years or for whatever the, the length of time that particular thing was for. And the, the thing that sticks out to me is that, it, not that they were this way, but it's more about, uh, it's, there's more to it than just going and being seen at church and marking me off, I'm, I'm here, you know, type of thing. It's being a part of the church is more than that. That's what the, uh, the writer of Hebrews is trying to get us to understand is that it's more than just coming and being seen on a Sunday. Now, we all know that there are people who do that. The only reason they come on Sunday is to be seen, to feel like they've done their duty to God for the week. I showed up, so God ought to be happy that I showed up uh, type of mentality. And, it's, and you know what? I feel sorry for people like that because there is more to a relationship with Christ than feeling like you've done him a service by showing up for worship. But it's important that we understand like this uh, writer in Hebrews is saying that we need to do more than, we need to come together, but there's more to it. We need to be that active part. Now, uh, the, uh, the word encourage that we read there where it says that we uh, should be in the habit of doing that, you know, coming together, but encouraging one another. When we think about that word encourage, it means literally to call to one side, to call for or to summon, to basically call someone to beside, be beside you. And that's what the writer of Hebrews is talking about, that we should encourage those people by calling them to our side, so to speak, to worship beside us in, and be a part of what we are doing in the church. And, of course, encourage means to speak to in a way that encourages, comforts, instructs, and strengthens. So think about that. If you are encouraging a brother or sister who maybe has that mentality of, I've done God a service by showing up for church, uh, then there are ways for us to encourage them. There's ways for us to comfort them. There's ways for us to instruct them that we need to be doing more and to strengthen them in their faith. And so there's a lot that we can do there because some people don't understand the importance of being act active in the, new, in the new community, in the church uh, that we've been looking at. They, they don't understand that because it is vital to share uh, with and to encourage and be connected with other Christians. And um, I think that... Uh, the, the Sunday night crowd or the Wednesday night crowd could very easily uh, amen, so to speak, the, uh, the value of being a part of the church more so than just slipping in for worship on Sunday morning and slipping out as soon as it's over because there is encouragement that comes from that. There's strengthening that comes from that. And there's a lot of th benefits to us. So why do you think that participating in a local group of believers is important? Why do you think it's important to uh, participate in the, in the local church? Okay. You have the opportunity to minister to other believers and to non-believers in the hopes of leading them to Christ. So uh, the opportunity to minister. What? A, okay. God tells us to do it. And so if he's telling us that it's important for us to participate in the local church, then maybe we need to do it, right? What else? It refuels us, right? Um, I, I'm going to, Larry, I'm going to share our text from just a few minutes, uh, a little bit ago. Uh, Larry was asking what was happening tonight at church, if it was missions night or uh, or not. And I said, I said, no, I said, you're just going to have to settle for my sorry Bible study tonight. And uh, Larry's response was basically, I'm ex I can't wait to be there. I, I, I look forward to being there. And I think it's for the sorry Bible study. But, uh, but you know, Larry and Laura were in uh, Ohio for uh, uh, Avery's uh, final recital and everything this weekend. And so y'all missed church on Sunday. Uh, not to call you out right here in front of God and everybody, but uh, Larry and Laura missed church on Sunday, folks. We, they were almost backsliding, and we got them back. Uh, but uh, for, for folks like yourself that are, you know, in Sunday school, involved in ministry, and do a lot of different things, when, like this past Sunday, there was something missing, wasn't there? You, you, you missed the fellowship. You missed the awesome preaching on Sunday morning. See? I, I got him to admit to it. Um, <laughs> that was the sunrise service, not during worship. Uh, but, but never... <laughs> Anyway, um, so, but you can relate to that, right? If we miss church, 
uh, and miss connecting with our brothers and sisters in Christ. We miss those times in our Sunday school classes with those individuals studying the scriptures or ministering in different ways, whether it's helping with children's church or in the nursery or, or some other area of service in the church. If we miss that, we literally feel like we're missing something. We miss that time. And so being a part of something, when, it, when we are missing from it, we miss it. it it's, it's, we have a longing for it. And so it's important for us to be active in the church and not just be, uh, like I said earlier, those that feel like they're doing a service to God by just simply showing up. And so um, the third uh, thing on your handout that is uh, a way about what it means for us to be a part of the body of Christ is for us to share our gifts, that we sh- you should share your gifts. And this is, a, this is something that, <clears throat> excuse me, that I've been teaching uh, for uh, probably close to 10 years now. Uh, this year marks my 10th year as a senior pastor. And, you know, during those 10 years, I can't tell you how long, how many times I've preached or taught or touched on the topic of spiritual gifts and how uh, we all have something to offer to the body of Christ. And as a believer, you know, you have a spiritual gift to share with the community of faith that is in our church. And so, you know, for us, we have to understand that not only are we supposed to understand our identity and who, how we relate to God and how we're supposed to be an active part of the church, but because God has given us spiritual gifts, it is our responsibility to use those spiritual gifts, as Paul says in Ephesians chapter 4, for the upbuilding or for the building up of uh, the kingdom or for the, the, of the church. And so uh, three things that we need to know about the spiritual gifts that uh, God has given to us is, first off, every believer has at least one spiritual gift. And that is something that I have tried to drill into folks over the last 10 years as best I, I could. Uh, because you'll always talk to people. They'll say, well, I don't, ha-, you know, there's nothing I can do in the church. Yeah, there is, because if you're a believer in Christ, then God has, through his Holy Spirit, gifted you with a spiritual gift. It's your responsibility to figure it out. It's not God's responsibility to hold up a big neon sign in front of you saying, Cody, your spiritual gift is this. No, it's our responsibility to learn what the spiritual gifts are and then figure out, you know, through prayer and through study what our spiritual gifts are so that that we can use them for the upbuilding of the kingdom. But y'all know as well as I do that there are plenty of people in this world that, that think I, I, I shook the hand of a preacher and I prayed a prayer and I'm saved and I don't have to do anything else. And that's a sad reality when people have that thought that that's all it takes because we see as we're learning tonight to be a part of the body of Christ, there's more to it than that. And so when, when they say I, there's nothing I can do in the church, yes, there's plenty for you to do in the body of Christ because we all have at least one spiritual gift, a manifestation of the Spirit as it's called. Uh, something else, the second thing is that spiritual gifts are not the same as natural talents. And the reason for that is because the way to look at a spiritual gift is it's sort of like your spiritual superpower. You know, uh, me and the boys, ever since the boys were little, we would go and watch uh, superhero movies, the Marvel movies and, and different ones. And my, the, my, my best time of, of picking them up just a little early on a Friday from school to take them to go watch one of those was when the, uh, the first Doctor Strange movie come out. And they asked me at the school why, I was pick, why the boys were needing to leave school. And I said, we're going to see the doctor. And so uh, we were. I just didn't say strange movie, but, you know, I told them that, you know, signed them out and said, we're going to see the doctor. And, and Misty still just shakes her head at the thought when she, uh, when she thinks about it. But nevertheless, uh, I'm, yeah, there you go. That's good. That's smart one, wasn't it? It took me three weeks to come up with that whenever I did. But no, I'm just picking. Um, but nevertheless, we would go watch those superhero movies. And there's always, you know, some sort of an origin story to the superhero. You know, you've got Captain America, who's basically a, a science experiment gone wrong, or the Hulk, who's been, you know, hit with gamma rays or whatever. Well, that's how they received their superpower, right? That's how they, that's how they became the, the superhero uh, that we know. Well, when we become a Christian and the Holy Spirit comes and takes up residence in our spiritual heart, then at that moment we receive one or maybe multiple spiritual gifts, superpowers. 
And that is our origin story, so to speak. And the thing is, we have to understand that we have those, and those are different than natural talents because we, we all have natural talents that can allow us to do certain things. But spiritual gifts are, a, as I said earlier, a manifestation of the Holy Spirit in our life. It means that the power of God is working through us to accomplish a task. Now let me ask you, are any of you God? I sure ain't. And so my t- natural talent or natural ability is far different than my spiritual gifts because my spiritual gifts are infused with the power of God. They're infused with the power of the Holy Spirit. It's that manifestation of the Spirit, meaning that it's the Holy Spirit showing off through us. There is nothing you or I can do with, about our spiritual gift that relates it to a natural ability and so, or a natural talent. And so they are two completely different things. But we have to understand that we have that superpower. We have that spiritual gift. It's our responsibility to use it in the kingdom. But then the third thing is that spiritual gifts are to be used for service and encouragement in the community of faith so that God might be glorified, may be glorified. And that's our responsibility is to use those spiritual gifts for that, for service and to build up the church. You know, there are a lot of great... There are a lot of good Christian people who sit on their spiritual hands and don't use their spiritual gifts because of a lot of different reasons. And they are the ones who lose out on the, the, the joy of ministering, as uh, Judy put it earlier, ministering to, uh, to people. But not only do they miss out on, on the joy of using their spiritual gifts, they also rob God of the glory that would come along with them using their spiritual gift. Because they take it, they pack it up in a box, they sit on their spiritual hands, however you want to phrase it. And then they don't use those spiritual gifts that God has given them. And so God is missing out on being glorified. And the church is not built as strongly as it could have been. And so there's a lot of things that go on when we don't use our gifts. When we, you know, sit on our spiritual hands, so to speak, there's a lot of things that go on that that cause uh, uh, sort of this ripple effect like that. And so uh, tonight, um, we're going to... Daryl, is the next one the list, or is it a Bible verse? It's a list, okay. So um, I asked you to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, but I'm going to ask you to also uh, hold that and, and find Romans chapter 12 as well, because we're going to read this, and this is going to help us uh, with your hand, the last part of your handout tonight. Uh, In Romans chapter 12, we're looking at verses 6 through 8, and this is one of Paul's listings of the spiritual gifts. And so uh, once you have found Romans 12, verse 6, just follow along with me. It says, We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. And so before you flip back over to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, go down there to uh, your list of, uh, of spiritual gifts. There's blanks on there. We're going to fill these in. Daryl, can you show that now? Um, these are the ones that are mentioned in those uh, verses that we just read. Um, it's the gift of prophesying, or that would, in, our, in the modern church, that would be preaching. Um, uh, prophesying or preaching, serving, teaching, encouragement, giving. And when we say giving, that is not, oh, I gave, I gave money to the offering on Sunday. That's my spiritual gift. No, that's not it. Uh, giving in a spiritual gift sense is a it is completely different. It's uh, it, everybody is called to give an offering to God, uh, but a the spiritual gift of giving is um, completely different. And I, I I don't know the best way to explain it um, other than um, there is a, it's sort of like the Bereans maybe uh, when we read that in the uh, in. Uh, the text that we used just a few Sundays ago, uh, where Paul's talking about the Bereans giving 
more than they were able. He, they gave beyond their ability. It's that kind of a giving that it's a, it's a spiritual gifting in that way. And then you also have leadership and mercy. And so, uh, you know, uh, Barnabas in the, uh, in the book of Acts, he is called the son of what? Encouragement. And so I'm guessing by what little we know about him that his spiritual gift or one of them would have been uh, prophesying because he was preaching the word, but also uh, encouragement and probably missiology, like missions type thing, but he was an encourager. And so uh, we see that. Uh, Serving is, uh, you know, some people are faithful servants. They do not mind to be behind the scenes sweeping the floor after everything is done, and they are comfortable with that position because that is how God has gifted them. And then there's others that, whether we want to be or not, are out in front doing the teaching and the preaching and things like that. Um, You also have leadership and uh, even mercy. And so now flip over to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and we're in verses 8 through 10. For this other list that Paul writes, the first was to the church at uh, Rome, and then this one is to the church at Corinth. But in 1 Corinthians 12, verses 8 through 10, it says this, To one there is given through the Spirit a message of wisdom, to another a message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by that one Spirit, to another miraculous powers, to another prophecy, to another distinguishing between spirits, to another speaking in different kinds of tongues, and to still another the interpretation of tongues. And so, Daryl, you can go to the next list there. These are the ones that, uh, that Paul mentions there in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Now, you will notice that there are one, two, three, there are four of those spiritual gifts that are italicized uh, because they are different in respects to usage than uh, the others. Uh, the, the spiritual gift of healing, the spiritual gift of miracles, uh, the spiritual gift of speaking in tongues, and the spiritual gift of interpreting tongues are all uh, gifts that we, in at least in the Baptist church and most Protestant churches, uh, there are some denominations that don't view it this way, but those four are ones that went off of the scene at the end of the first century, that God used those for the beginning of the church, for the foundation of the church, to get the church started, and then they've, they're not typically used today. Now, does that mean that God is limited and that God can't use them? No, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying, though, is that we don't typically see those particular uh, spiritual gifts used in the modern church. And the interesting thing, you know, more so than the healings and miracles, uh, and, this is, and when I say miracles, it's not that a miracle can't happen. It's a, it's a fact that if Lee's spiritual gift was miracles, he could, he could make the lame walk like the apostles did. And last time I checked, you can't do that, can you? Okay, just making sure. Uh, but, you know, healing and miracles are seen that way, but there are certain denominations, especially of the more charismatic nature, that see speaking in tongues and interpreting tongues as spiritual gifts that are still used. The catch there is that if someone is speaking in tongues, there's supposed to be what? Someone in the congregation who what? Interprets. And so if somebody just, you know, if Terry back here just stood up and started speaking in tongues, then somebody's going to have to interpret it or it's not a spiritual gift. It's not. Larry can. I don't know if that's good if we let Larry interpret. But, uh, but you know, that's the, that's the reality of it is that if someone is speaking in tongues, someone in the congregation has to uh, be able to interpret it. And so, and that's, the, that, that is, that's biblical. And the other aspect of that is that sometimes when it comes to the speaking in tongues and the uh, interpreting of tongues type, you know, uh, view, uh, we have to remember that God is a God of order and peace, not a God of chaos. And so there wouldn't be a division. There wouldn't be a, oh, my gift is, is speaking. We just didn't have anybody here to interpret today. It doesn't, that's division. That's not order and peace as the body of Christ would have. Again, prophecy is, uh, is preaching, discernment of spirits, being able, you know, I don't, my wife might be, she's at a meeting tonight for work, but uh, my wife, one of her spiritual gifts, um, it may very well be discernment because she, you know, she talks to somebody and she's like, Mm-mm, don't believe a word they say. You know, and I'm like, what do you mean? And she's like, 
I just, I, just trust me. She's very discerning when it comes to people. And so I like it because it's like my go-to. I'm like, what do you think? <laughs> She's like, yeah, it's probably true. You know, something like that. And I'm like, okay. But uh, she is very discerning. So um, she's a human lie detector sometimes. Uh, the uh, wisdom, that is more than just having, you know, good life experience that you can draw on. This is, a, uh, this is the case where you have spiritually, you are spiritually gifted with wisdom that comes about only from the Spirit. You know, there was a gentleman at a church I used to serve at that um, didn't say a whole lot during deacon's meetings. And any time he would start to talk, I would clue in. I'd, I mean, I'd be, I'd be listening intently to what he was saying because he was one of those that when he spoke, you could tell that one of his spiritual gifts was wisdom. And he was not wasteful with his words, <laughs> like some of us who like to talk. And, uh, but he was, he was gifted in that area. So when he started to talk, he commanded a respect. And it wasn't because he was just one of the other deacons. It was because you knew that this man had the spiritual gift of wisdom. So when he started talking, you kinda, everybody kind of listened and paid attention to what he was saying. Uh, knowledge and faith, those are uh, you know, spiritual gifts as well. And so you know, spiritual gifts are important to the uh, uh, an important part of the body of Christ. And so I know that we have done, uh, when I've preached on spiritual gifts before and made available spiritual gifts inventories or tests, however you want to look at it, uh, a lot of our folks have taken them before and uh, done them. But can anybody share what, or anybody want to share, what a spiritual gift you know you have, whether it's from just reading the scriptures and knowing, you know what, I figured out years ago that one of my spiritual gifts are these. I didn't have to take a test. Or you took a spiritual gifts inventory and you're like, that made so much sense that I would be gifted in this way because that's how I best minister to people. Anybody have uh, a spiritual gift that they'd want to mention tonight that you, you just know that's one of your spiritual gifts? Faith. Faith. All right. Anyone else? Don't everyone jump at one time. Anyone, uh, anyone have the gift of teaching? Any of our, uh, there's a couple of our Sunday school teachers in here that ought to be raising their hands. Uh, there's, uh, you know, when, when, and that's a, you know, that, that can be a natural talent, but if God is using it in the body for, uh, you know, as a spiritually gifted way, that's a, a great thing too. Uh, as we talked about a minute ago, Lee has the spiritual gift of miracles. So if you need anything, talk with him after church. Uh, no, but, uh, you know, there's different ones. Anybody have the spiritual gift of service? Anybody just, you know, that's just the way that I know I can serve in the church and, and be used. All right, there's a couple here. Yeah, all right. And so, you know, when we think about those things, it's important for us to know what our spiritual gifts are and then turn around and use them in the, uh, in the service of the church. I had someone come to me not too long ago, probably uh, a couple months ago, maybe two months ago, a month and a half ago, and they said, look, I've taken a spiritual gifts test before, and I've taken this one. This is what it says. How can I get plugged into the church and serve using what I know is supposed to be my spiritual gift? And we sat down, and we talked about it, and I said, well, there's you know, two or three ways that you could use this, and that person uh, went and got involved in one of the ministries of the church, that I, that I you know, sort of pointed them in. And not only did they get involved in it, they got somebody else involved with them. And so it's, it's sort of this compounding effect of people using their spiritual gifts in ways that serve the church, that serve the Lord. And so it's important that we do that. And so it's important that we understand when it comes to us being a part of that bonded community, that, that, that body of faith, that we're supposed to know how we identify with God. We're supposed to have... Uh, an active part or an active place in the church and in the body, but we're also supposed to be a part of it by using our spiritual gifts. And so, um, can we lose our spiritual gifts? I, you know, I would like to say, yet yeah, personally, I would like to say, you know, it'd be a good thing if someone doesn't want to use them that the Lord just takes it away from them. But I don't know that that's necessarily the case. I think that it, it might be. I think that it's just a matter of we either use it or we don't. It's not a matter of we use it or we lose it. I think it's a matter of we use it or we don't. Because if that person truly has a, a, a salvation experience with Christ, then you know, they're not going to lose their salvation, 
based on what we read in the scriptures. They're not going to lose their salvation. So if they can't lose their salvation, they're not going to lose the Holy Spirit living inside of them, which means they don't lose that gifting. But can they suppress the usage of that uh, or the use of that, um, that gift to the point where you'd wonder if they had any? Sure, they could. Uh, but I don't think we can lose it because we can't lose our salvation. Oh, yeah, we, oh, and the Lord may do that. He may, you know, those opportunities that we could use our spiritual gift in a particular way, if we don't, uh, if we don't use them, the Lord may say, you know what, if you're not going to be a faithful steward of the spiritual gift that I've given you, I'm just going to, I'm going to pull it away from, I'm going to pull those opportunities away from you. And, you know, oh, go ahead. Yeah, it should. It should make you absolutely just miserable. And, and the, the easy example on this that I can definitely relate to, and I think we could all sort of see, is the individual who God is calling to be a, a pastor or a minister, and they either are rejecting of that call, or they surrender to the call, and then do whatever that may disqualify them from services as a pastor, or they quit serving. They, they, they disqualify themselves by just pursuing a lifestyle or a particular, you know, maybe it's following a, a secular career rather than a call to ministry like God has called on their life. And, and that individual will be absolutely miserable. I know I was miserable before I surrendered to the call of ministry, and I had no idea that the Lord had gifted me in that way for, for, for being a pastor. Uh, but once we surrender, there is this peace, there is this joy knowing that we're doing what God has called us to do. I think that's, you sort of get atrophy of your spiritual gift. And that sort of goes, I don't know if y'all heard uh, Jackie in the back there, but she said that basically she heard it put one time that you, you, your spiritual gift is sort of like a spiritual muscle, that if you don't use it, it's going to sort of atrophy. And so um, I think it's, you know, the muscle doesn't ever completely go away because the muscle is always there, but it's not near as strong as it potentially could be. Right. And so, and you have to have that fuel inside the body to, to make that happen with your regular muscle. And so we have to have the fuel of the Holy Spirit to, to draw from and continue to work towards. So I hope that, uh, that this, uh, not only this lesson, but all the other 15 that we've had on the early church has, uh, has hopefully uh, opened your eyes to some things about the, uh, the early church uh, from uh, 1900 years ago. And um, now that we're through with our study of the early church, after our missions night next Wednesday night, we will uh, start a series on the book of Galatians that is uh, called A Case for Freedom. And basically what we're doing is we're taking different aspects of the, the, the legal system in the U.S., and applying yet that to the uh, to what's taught in Scripture. That's just sort of the, the background idea. But what we're going to look at is how we are set free from the law, the Old Testament law, because of what Christ did. And so we're going to examine that over the next several weeks, uh, looking at the book of Galatians, because that's what Paul wrote it uh, for, was to the, uh, to the Jews in Galatia, which was basically part of modern-day Turkey, some of the places that he went on his mission trips, uh, his first missionary journey and his second one at least. Uh, but what we see is that he's writing this to Judaizers is what they're called. And Judaizers are basically those who uh, were uh, Christians who said you had to follow the Old Testament law to be a Christian, meaning that you had to follow the dietary laws, meaning you had to follow the, the law of circumcision, that you had to follow other Old Testament practices so that you could be a good Christian. And so Paul's whole reason for writing the book of Galatians is to say, hey, we're set free from the law. You know, this is the case for freedom. You know, and so that's the, the study that we'll have uh, starting uh, in two weeks. And so I hope that that will uh, be a good study for us on the book of Galatians. And so with that being said, uh, Sunday morning we start into... Yes, sir. Ha <laughs> ha.
Yeah, I was worried when you said you had a quote from George Carlin, whether we could share it in church. Um, but there is. <laughs> there is. There is there is a, a ton of truth in that. that there's, you know, I guess, wait a minute, I guess I've got as much authority as the Pope, right? Um, but uh, but like, like, you know, he said, just doesn't have as many people following him and that's, or convinced that he has that power. And that's the that's that's a sad uh, a sad reality in the world that we live in today. Uh, how many people are uh, believing in a non biblical hierarchy that is not scriptural? So we ought to take it seriously. that we yeah we we should take it serious that we have um, the 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 priesthood responsibility that we have. Um, as a believer in Christ, that we can go to the Lord, um, you know, uh, very easily and have access to Him. Um, Sunday morning, we'll be uh, starting a new series. You know, we've been looking at what it means for us to be a believer in Christ and the things that we should do. And so uh, this coming Sunday starts our uh, uh, message series on worship called The Art of Worship. And so we'll do that. And then Sunday night, we will be in uh, Genesis 22 looking at Abraham's sacrifice or potential possible near sacrifice of Isaac. And so not to be lost on us is the fact that in the next chapter, Sarah dies. And so, uh, you know, maybe uh, after waiting for 90 years to have a child and then your husband goes and tries to kill him, it may have done more damage to Sarah (laughs) than we realize. But uh, we'll study that, uh, uh, the sacrifice of Abraham on, or Abraham's sacrifice on Sunday evening. So hope you'll be here for that. I'll close this out with a, a word of prayer, and then we'll be dismissed. So let's pray. Father, we thank you that, that you love us. We thank you that your word is so clear to us about what our responsibilities in the, in the life of the church is. And so, Father, I pray that we would take seriously the things that you have called us to do, uh, to be that active part of the church, to use our spiritual gifts, and to understand our identity and how we uh, have our identity in you. Father, I pray that you would continue to bless our church. We're very grateful for the, uh, the wonderful things that you're doing in the life of our church, and we just pray that we would continue to be good stewards of the resources and the people that you uh, entrust to us. And so, Father, we just ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.